Okay, so welcome everyone to this session about new ways of reading, visualizing, and using IMS specifications. Uh, I'm Marcus Jilling, the moderator of this session, and coincidentally also one of the speakers. Um, we will be uh, running through a presentation, hoping to leave uh, ample time for questions afterwards. Uh, you will be able either to, during our talk, uh, type your questions in the chat, uh, or afterwards, of course, coming on to audio and asking us that way as well. Um, yes, so basically, I think, Josh, that we could start and you are opening. So feel free to move ahead. All right. Thank you, Marcus. It would help if I took myself off mute. That would uh, be a good thing to get us started. But hi, everybody. Um, all right. So uh, I'll start by introducing myself. Marcus already mentioned both of our names, but I'm Joshua McGee. I'm a technical program manager here with IMS. Uh, what that basically means is I, uh, I oversee the development of some of the specifications, uh, and Marcus is a solutions architect. Uh, he does a little bit more of the back-end work, uh, and together we're going to hope to give you a presentation that kind of hits on both sides of that divide, right? The business and product piece, as well as the behind-the-scenes piece. So, uh, And I hope you like to laugh, because I try to make my presentations kind of amusing. So. Um, before I go ahead and get started, I'll say, you know, I've been feeling a little bit nostalgic lately. Um, I recently had had a child, a first time parent, and it's just it's just got me thinking kind of about the past. And, and that's kind of how I started building this this presentation for us. So I'm going to start a little bit by talking about kind of the problem we're looking to solve. You know, maybe the problem is the best way to put it. But, you know, what is it that we're looking to do and how how we get there and why this, the path that we're taking is, is a good way to go about it. So. Uh, as I said, I've been feeling a little nostalgic, waxing nostalgic, if you will. Uh, I'm 42, uh, so 1999 was kind of right in my peak. I had gotten out of high school. I was in college making a lot of bad decisions. Uh, 1999 was a pretty important year. It was uh, uh, a, lot of, a lot of really great things happened. I mean, everybody loved the first movie in the second Star Wars trilogy, right? Everybody loved that movie, I think. Uh, you know, Britney Spears was topping the charts and, and she's still in the news today. So something must have been going, going well there. Uh, everybody was freaking about about Y2K. I, uh, I remember some really crazy conversations uh, back in the day about how everything was going to explode. We were going to uh, devolve into kind of all, all living in little communes because there was going to be no connectivity between anybody. I had frosted tips in my hair. And if anybody was alive during that phase, you know why I chose not to include a picture of it. Uh, things have gotten a little better since then in my world. <laughs> uh, but, you know, taking, taking that kind of out of it, you know, a little bit of levity at the beginning. Uh, 1999 was the year that IMS became kind of its own, its own entity. It, uh, it spun off um, from an EDUCAUSE project uh, in 1999, 1999, 1999 officially. Uh, and started putting out um, uh, EdTech interoperability specifications. And anybody who's done any work or has any knowledge of IMS, so probably a lot of the people on this call have either used or heard of or been involved with some of those to this date. So, and uh, you can see the, the awesome high-res graphic that was the original IMS logo right here on the screen. It took me way too long to find that. Um, you know, so in 1999, they released two specifications, right? Two documents. Uh, things were good. Things were easy. There were two. They were kind of really different, doing different things. They didn't have to really worry about uh, how they talked about things together. But, you know, never, never really stays that simple. You know, 1999 was simple for me. I was in college. I was maybe going to class and nothing else really was happening in my world. Now I have a mortgage and a kid and dog and all this other stuff I have to worry about. Thing, things never stay simple. So let's hop forward a little bit. We're gonna we're gonna take a brief interlude into 2018, and uh, we're gonna use me as the example here. And I no longer have frosted tips in a, in 2018, so you don't have to worry about me having really terrible hair. Uh, but in 2018, um, I came on board with IMS Global, and I had been in the telecom sphere for the majority of my career. I had been working. Uh, for some software as a service platforms who designed point of sale in our integrations for, you know, buying cell phones and 
things that go along with cell phones and uh, doing reporting about people buying cell phones. I had I had come directly out of college as as a teacher. I spent my first um, post college half a year teaching third grade. Um, quickly decided it wasn't for me because dealing with other people that weren't other kid weren't the kids was uh, not my wheelhouse. So you know, 2018 I joined IMS with a with a technology background, but not really any ed tech background. So. Uh, you know, they brought me on really to talk about Caliper. And if you know what Caliper is, it's the uh, IMS specification that describes how you send uh, events about learning activities. So, you know, somebody read a book, somebody clicked on a page, et cetera. Uh, and I was just thrown into a bunch of um, uh, terminology and words and acronyms that I had, I had no, no knowledge of, no pre-knowledge of. And, and it was a little bit overwhelming at the time. And um, you know, I looked like that with my head on hands on my head and my brain swirling all over the place. And then uh, as things happen, you know, when you when you start somewhere and if you show any sort of uh, <laughs> proclivity for success, they start to add on and give you more things. So then all of a sudden I was doing analytics and I was doing rostering and I didn't know what that would, what that was either. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I started getting involved in some tools and content stuff and uh, now, you know, credentials are all the rage and academic standards. And as you can, you can kind of see where I'm going here, right? There is a lot, there are a lot of topics and there's a lot of breadth to what the IMS suite of standards and specifications cover. Um, you know, and this is all organically driven based off of the needs of the market. Uh, so let's, uh, let's kind of go to where we're, you know, kind of initially stating the problem, right? As, as IMS staff, I interact with a bunch of people who are IMS staff, members, people at institutions, people at suppliers who don't necessarily or, uh, interact with IMS or its specifications all that often from this country, from other countries, from all over the place. Uh, and I get asked variations of the same types of questions all the time. Um, how, do your, how, do these, how do these things work together, right? I have, there's a small application it's like, and they'll come to me and they'll tell me a story like, well, my institutional partners told me I have to roster with one roster. Um, and then I have to launch with LTI and I don't know what those things mean. And I don't know why I have to have two different things to do to work with them that, you know, that's not really what we were doing before. What, how do these things all work together? Why are there two different ones? You know, how, how come uh, the information that LTI sends isn't the same necessarily as the information that one roster sends. Um, you know, the, these sort of things that have sprung up organically as these develop, as these standards develop to meet needs independently in their own silos, right? And that, that's kind of how we got to that. Um, and, and just having these sort of natural inflection points where we get create, where we get duplication can lead to confusion. Um, and as I noted, you know, things like how, do, how are the same thing handled in multiple specifications? Uh, how come we have these duplicates and how do they work together? So now we're in the current day. We spent some time back in 1999 with all the crazy things that happened. We took a brief stop over in 2018 where we talked about me going from a very confused person with a swirly brain to a person with amazingly coiffed hair who can talk about specifications for an hour. Uh, and now we're going to talk about today, 2021. So if you think about any of the IMS specifications, uh, I'm going to just go through some examples here from what I'm familiar with, but let's take one roster, for example. One roster, for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, is IMS's specification about sending administrative data between um, K-12 systems. So, you know, things about users or people, things about class structures and courses, grades, et cetera. And one roster defines all of those things inside its specification. It has a data model. In that data model, it defines what a one roster user is. It defines what a one roster class is. It defines what a grade is. Now we have another specification, CLR, which is, comp, uh, which is about sending achievement between systems. And, one, and CLR has its own data model. And in its data model, it describes what a person is, what an achievement is. Let's move on to the next one. We have Edu API. Edu API is pretty similar to one roster, except it's for a higher ed uh, integrations and it defines a person and an educational offering, which is like a class. 
uh, et cetera. And then we have something like QTI. QTI defines a person and it defines a quiz and it defines an item, like all of these different pieces. So now we have these four different IMS specifications. And if you think, if you look at what I have here, you can see that they're all doing very similar things. Now, the problem of course, is that since each of one of them have, have done it on their own, they might not necessarily be the same, right? The way one roster defines person and the way CLR defines person and the way Edge API defines person and the way QTI defines person aren't necessarily the same. There may be overlap and there most likely is overlap and similarities between them, but the fact that they've been developed in these silos independently means that there is room for differentiation between them. And that's kind of the place where we're at now. So uh, in the future, what we want to instead do, and we're going to go into this much deeper as we go forward, is we're going to have this idea called the common data model. And what that does basically is it says we have this, this commonly defined set of attributes that each of the specifications can use. And that way, you know, one, one roster defines a person or one roster has person, Edge API has person, CLR has person, QTI has person, but they're all the same person. And of course we understand that uh, one roster and Edge API might have slightly different needs because one's a K-12 and one's a higher ed, but the basis is the same. And then the, the, the differentiation can be defined as needed by the specification as I kind of point out over here on the uh, QTI specific thing. So, uh, Let's frame that a little bit, right? So IMS today has act 11 active specifications and I use a little asterisk there because it's really more than that because each of these kind of branches out into other things. Um, LTI in particular has a number of different service specifications. Uh, there are different versions of one roster. There are different versions of Caliper, et cetera, et cetera. But there are 11 active specifications, uh, each with a number of different certification paths. And I'm using that just to kind of say, um, you know, there's a lot of different, different uh, options. So if you just want to see what I mean, um, these, if you were to go into the one, into the IMS certified product directory and look at the one roster options, this cuts off at the bottom here, but you can see all of the different ways that you can certify to be a one roster uh, uh, certified product. Um, and it keeps going way down the list. <laughs> So, you know, this, this makes me think, and the light bulb goes on in my head, and et cetera, uh, is how can, we, how can we make sense of all this, right? You know, how do, we, how do we get from that place where we have everything separate to the place where everything pulls from a, co a combined piece? And how do, we, how, do we, how do we instrument that? How do we present that to people? And then how do we solve for the underlying bits? So let's move into the second piece here, which is where we talk about what IMS is doing to sort of help solve for these problems. There's two primary pieces and, and uh, I'm gonna be presenting on one and then I'm gonna hand it over to Marcus after my mouth is too dry to talk anymore and he's gonna present on the other. Uh, the first one is this idea of the student learning data model, which we often just refer to as the SLDM, um, which is a front end view on top of IMS data models that help it to make more sense for people who may not be as technical or could be technical, but just wanna see, see a kind of easy way to connect the dots basically. Uh, it contains a bunch of um, uh, things like crosswalks. It contains um, ways to browse through the data models, to search through the data models of the IMS specifications. And the common data model, which is going to be the driver of all of this in the future, which brings, as I, as I alluded to before, kind of brings together the IMS data models to reduce the duplication and confusion um, and uh, makes it so that when we're, when two different specifications or two groups are talking about the same concept, they're talking about it in the same way. So let's talk a little bit about the first piece, the SLDM, uh, which is an example of a, uh, a, basically what we call a lens on top of this modeling that we're doing. Uh, that is a tool that contextualizes the data in IMS specifications through what we call kind of grokkable lenses, right? The, the whole point of the SLDM is to present the information to you in a way that makes sense to you, regardless of how intimately familiar you may be with IMS specifications, right? You may not know what a QTI test part is. You may not know what, an, what a one roster uh, assessment result profile is, but to use the SLDM, you don't need to know either of those things. What instead we've done is we've created these 
these contextual topic areas that help to guide your understanding of the specifications, the interplay between the specifications and the fundamental data that sits below all of that. So uh, if you think, if you see that little hexagonal I, uh, diagram on my screen, that's what I'm talking about. Each one of those represents uh, a contextual domain area or a topic or just a, a collection of things together that make sense together. Um, we've also taken the step to say, you know, the data in the in the data models for the IMS standards can sometimes come off a little bit as techies. Um, you know, developers and people making the specifications write things that make sense for them to use, but not necessarily make sense for people who need to talk about it. So we've gone through and we've uh, we've we've used this concept of a friendly name or a friendly uh, term um, to sort of ease that that intellectual burden. That you might might have from not having the technical underpinning understanding of the IMS specifications. And the example I like to use here is uh, all, a lot of most of the IMS specifications have this concept of source ID, uh, which is meant to be the um, identifier for systems to use, right, to, for interoperability. And the key key bit there is that source ID enables interoperability. It's not it's not a definer of me, right? It's not like my social security number or something like that, um, or, or my government ID or my driver's license or something of those lines. It's just an identifier for two systems to talk about me. Um, and so in the SLDM, if you were to look that, that property up, that attribute up, you'd find it under that, or you'd also find it under the name interoperability ID. Because in the long run, what that that identifier is for is to create interoperability. So that's kind of the, the way we thought about presenting this, I, this information back out to the public. Uh, as I noted, it contains the ability to search and you, you can, and that search is powered by either or the definition or the name in the spec or that friendly name. So if you search for a concept, you can find things that are related to that if they're in those uh, items. And then last, the last feature I want to touch on before I go into each one individually is this idea of crosswalks. You know, another one of the common themes or common questions I field is how is one roster related to sets? And if you're in the K-12 sphere, you probably know what both of those things are. Um, and what we, what we decided was that that is a frequent enough and a common enough thing. How does X in IMS relate to Y in somewhere else that we should enable a way to, to map between those two things? So we've created this crosswalk, crosswalking functionality that allows us to say this thing, this concept, this term, this property, this, this technical thing in an IMS specification equals this thing in another specification. And, and this, is, this is how they're related. Okay, next, let's see. So I talked a little bit about that concept of lenses, right? And, and, and uh, from that perspective, um, you know, what the student learning data model is looking to do is be cross-cutting in the IMS specifications under a contextualized topic domain that makes sense to the viewer. So these are the, the sets of domains that we talk about in the SLDM, and these are all common concepts that exist within education and ed tech that make sense to people in education and ed tech, right? Everybody knows what users and organizations are. Everybody knows what learner records are. Everybody understands what assignment and assessments are. What people don't know, however, is, well, what pieces of uh, case or QTI are in the assignment and assessment realm. You know, if I was, uh, if I am somebody interested in enrollment and attendance, what specification pieces make, you know, from IMS would power that and, you know, and, and integrations that are built on top of that. So that's, that's sort of what we've done. And right, so you may, what the SLDM can, does is it collects information from each of the specifications where relevant and organizes them underneath these banners, these topical domain areas, right? So, you know, you can get a number, uh, you can get properties or, or concepts or, or whatever from all of these different specifications, and they may make sense within that learner learning activities bucket, uh, in which case they would be presented there. And then the same thing, you may get uh, items from all of those specifications in the assignment and assessment bucket, and they'd be presented there. What it also does, though, is, you know, as you're browsing through this experience in the SLDM browser, you can then uh, breadcrumb trail into the actual specifications or into other information about them. 
So this is this is kind of the uh, the look at what the actual you know if you were to click into one of the domain areas this is what you would see right so the their data collections um, here you're going to see just a bunch of one roster stuff but it could be a collection of information from any number of IMS specifications um, and it, it includes their name which is that friendly or or uh, detect. Uh, uh, term that I talked about, the technical term, which is their actual specification, uh, the name of the, the property and the specification, the definition of it. Um, and again, as I said, uh, if there are crosswalks to something we've uh, crosswalked to, it'll provide the details of that. So for example, these are items in one roster that are related to an organizational structure. Um, and those are similar to uh, things that exist in said so that you will see that here. Um, you can also just view the crosswalks separately from the data collections, right? We have on the main page just a link to the crosswalks. Right now, it's just SEDS, um, but and and it SEDS to one, it's SEDS to one roster and SEDS to CLR. So those are the that's the scope of the two crosswalks that we've done. But we do have plans for additional uh, crosswalks in the future, both to um, other uh, uh, like um, governmental agency type things like SEDS. Uh, we have, uh, as well as investigating doing crosswalks to actual supplier data models is something that we've talked about. Uh, and then just adding in additional features. Um, this is available up uh, uh, for the public to see. You can get to it. The URL is here on the bottom of the page. Um, and uh, we have a bunch of features that are planned to do this based off of feedback from people uh, after I've talked into their ear for a bunch of time. Uh, we also have the ability to search, right? And so if you were to go into the SLDM and search for the top, for something like line item, right? A, 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 which is a common grade book term, um, you would get back a set of terms across the different specifications where that term existed. So, and, and that could be again in the friendly term name or the technical name. Uh, behind all of this, so this, again, the, the SLDM is this sort of, this, this lens or this uh, curated set of information intended to make sense to people who understand the educational concepts, but maybe not the IMSEs, the techies, or the underlying fun, uh, technological concepts. Um, the, all of that is powered by the actual data in the specifications, and that's available in this IMS data dictionary idea, which is basically all the data models and all the specifications as they exist now, uh, that are searchable, browsable, uh, et cetera, that you can, um, if you're, uh, I believe this is member gated, that you can, that you can use. Uh, and the idea is that as we move over time into that common data model that I spoke about a little bit earlier, uh, this would be, you know, go from saying, you know, all of these different uh, specifications just linking to their individual data model, they would link to the parts of the common data model that they use. And at this point, I will hand it over to Marcus. Thank you, Josh. So under the hood, um, a not too deep um, description of uh, how this thing works and uh, where we want to take it moving forward. So Josh mentioned that the uh, 10 or so active specification areas are available uh, in, in, the, in the SLDM service and, and others as well. And the simple answer to how we do that is, is the first bullet here. We are utilizing a common machine readable representation of IMS data and service models. So it's actually a, a way to uh, represent the specifications, not as you read them when you visit them on the website as an HTML document, as a web page, but as a piece of data that we can uh, uh, parse and understand and do additional things with. So there's, there's more reasons than presentation and documentation for this. So what Josh has spoken to so far is, is basically the, the first bullet here, right? To explore new paradigms for, for technical documentation. Um, we see several reasons for this. Uh, Josh talked a lot about the discovery aspect. Uh, we think as well that in terms of general usability for our target audiences here, uh, which to, to quite a large extent, of course, is, is technical architects and implementers, et cetera. 
uh, we should be able to to score better on on usability uh, i.e how long time does it take you to get the answer to the question you have how many steps and links do you have to follow before you get there and so on and satisfying that target group the technical target group um, for those of you who've been engaged in in, in this kind of, of problem area of usability it's hard right it's very very hard if you look at the research that's been done on how developers actually engage with technical documentation it it could be if you're a, a working group member who spent a lot of time writing a very beautiful specification it could be quite depressing to learn that nobody reads the specification from the start to the end you have a window of say 20 to 30 seconds before the person looking for an answer if she he or she hasn't found it by then uh will give up and go somewhere else right so we say explore new paradigms because we're not saying that we've hit the sweet spot in any of these new services that we've put up for the membership uh, but we're exploring to learn how we can come closer to a sweet spot moving forward so that about documentation the the common representation uh, for data and service models also allows us to move forward regarding auto generation of artifacts and here we're talking about the ability to not hand code as a working group member the schemas uh, the samples etc that are that are typically part of a specification document set but to have a machine do them for you we're even and this has actually been uh, available for quite some time in ims uh, albeit not used by all of the working groups we even have the ability to generate uh, specification documents entirely based on this uh, machine readable representation. So we want to move forward with this to uh, save time for working groups to be able to deliver faster, to be able to deliver more stuff. Uh, imagine, for example, this idea of being able to provide uh, reference implementation code libraries uh, early in, in the lifespan of a specification uh, maybe even at the launch day code that developers can use uh, perhaps to study uh, but primarily to, to test against right that's one of the things we want to be able to do with with a much higher frequency and much faster than we've done before so yes auto generation is is a big another uh, driver of this thirdly uh, but not least uh, is of course the, the consistency aspect of this. So if you think of a handwritten uh, specification consisting of a number of documents, a number of schemas, a number of samples, etc., the chances of inconsistencies, errors creeping into one or several of those is, is um, higher when it's done by hand and not by a machine, right? So of course, there can be errors in our machine readable models as well. But if, if those models are used to generate uh, a majority of the artifacts, then at least it will be a consistent error. If you see what I mean, there will not be uh, inconsistencies in between the different artifacts. So these, I would say, are, are the uh, primary drivers. Next slide, please, Josh. So how do we do this? Yeah, I already mentioned there, there's an abstract model created um, that um, is um, historically has been done primarily by the IMS architects, staff in other words. <clears throat> but we're working now on trying out new forms of, of doing this authoring of the abstract model that could be uh, hopefully uh, end up in, in, in a place where it's simple and fast enough so that working group members will be able to, to use it with uh, ease and uh, happiness as well. So basically, 
these models are created, there's a language established that uh, you express your data models and service models in based on UML, which is a uh, actually quite old right now, uh, unified modeling language standard uh, that, that, that we've been using. Uh, that's then parsed and uh, loaded into a service that we've stood up. Uh, it's been up and running for about a year now. We're working uh, continuously on it to improve it, make it better, uh, increase the, the amount of services that we provide and so on. But but the, the gist of the matter is that we have this service uh, that's up and running that we can use for various tasks. This service then exposes APIs, uh, both the GraphQL and the REST API. And it allows us then to do things such as what's called uh, or serializations here, where you can write out um, various type of artifacts, such as uh, schemas, for example, uh, automatically based on the contents of the model. So yes, next slide, please. And so here's the GraphQL API, one of the two types of services that we're exposing, which is actually the actual fundament of, for example, the SLDM. The SLDM uh, web pages are driven from this. Um, and so Josh said we had 10 specs that it may therefore be confusing to you to see the claim here that there are 26 models available. And yes, um, part of that is due to the fact that we have, for example, the LIS specifications loaded in here, learning information services, um, which are, uh, we're not in the set, I believe, Josh, that, that you uh, uh, counted in the beginning. Uh, they are um, not actively worked upon specifications. Uh, one could argue that one roster and edu API uh, in a way, is intending to eventually fully uh, replace LIS. But the list you see at the right, basically all of those things there, whatever they are, uh, have been expressed in the common representation, in the common model. And that allows us to treat them uniformly and build uh, things such as the, the SLDN. Um, there's... Speaking of the common data model, you may see on the fifth line or so in the list there at the right, it says common data model core. So the common data model here is just another of the 26 models. It's represented in the same way as the specification models, right? It just lives its life there, um, waiting, so to speak, for somebody to want to use it. Um, the idea here is that eventually, and I will, by the way, uh, not talk a lot about the common data model today. Uh, there is a session on Thursday, a full glorious hour about it, if you're interested in learning more of the details about what we're thinking there. But the idea is simply that it shares this common representation and moving forward, uh, we are intending to make future versions of our specifications to make use of the common constructs that it defines. And so right now, uh, EDU API is being drafted based on the common data model. Uh, Open badges and CLR is going into new revisions and it's likely that they will also be uh, using common data model constructs. And perhaps the same will also be true about the case 1.1 revision, although we're not sure yet. But yes, this is the GraphQL API. It's available to members if there would be a member who would be interested in accessing the raw data. All in all, there is about, I think, 9,000 nodes in the API today, meaning classes and properties from all these specifications, uh, all represented and exposed in, in the same API. Could actually be interesting, uh, especially if we get some of the even older specifications in here eventually, uh, could be interesting even for a, from a digital archaeology perspective to look at how the, the world has changed over the 20 years that IMS has been producing specifications. 
Yes, and you can browse all these at the data dictionary URL that you see towards the left bottom, uh, standard slash data underscore dictionary. That gives you a uh, full unadulterated access to, to this entire set of, of, of notes. Yes, next slide, please. So besides the uh, GraphQL API, which is the main entry point for accessing the data, we're also building slowly but securely a number of REST endpoints um, that are also exposing some kind of service related to uh, specification uh, specifications, either uh, as you're building them as a working group or as you're studying them afterwards. Most recently, uh, we've added a few features uh, to cater for working groups to be able to work with the, uh, the dedicated user interface that we have right now, which we haven't shown uh, today, uh, but there is a working group sandbox user interface where you can load your models, uh, review them, discuss them, etc. cetera. Um, but we're also uh, bringing for dedicated APIs for generating artifacts then, as I mentioned earlier. And we have two early uh, endpoints now for generating JSON samples, as well as generating JSON schemas. Uh, this obviously will grow over time um, and the quality of what comes back uh, will also grow over time. If you request access to this as a member, we will happily give it to you. You may not be super happy with the quality of the JSON samples, for example. As I mentioned, we have 9,000 nodes and uh, the sample generator doesn't uh, know all those nodes by person, so to speak. So the samples are sometimes a bit uh, anemic, if you will. All right, next slide, please. All right, so how are we doing all this? Um, so as far as the implementation of the model processing service to begin with, we are looking at this as, as a core platform feature of the platform that IMS is building in order to provide services to our members. So this is an IMS staff project at this point. Uh, when it comes to the data model, common data model, and again, I'll talk more about uh, maintenance and so on uh, on Thursday. Uh, it's also been done as a staff only thing on, up until now, and that's because it's been uh, quite unstable. Um, we're not saying it's stable now, but it, it's at least stabilizing. Uh, so we have the ambition and hopes that uh, members of IMS will be uh, willing to join in a uh, maintenance committee-like work uh, soon. I would guess that's going to open in, in 20, uh, next year, 2022. Um, that's much like the uh, security committee, for example, that exists, that takes care of the security framework for IMS. It's kind of an umbrella role uh, that, that we really need the IMS membership for. Uh, the common data model uh, is not an easy project. Uh, there's a lot of challenges in there. Um, technical, some of them, uh, but to a large extent, I think uh, the challenges are about semantics, about structure, about life cycles, and about evolution over long periods of time. So um, if you're anything like me, you, you think that sounds like a fun challenge. So I hope to see you in 2022 as we uh, invite members to uh, apply to the maintenance committee. Um, in terms of next steps, um, we are, as I said, continuously working on this. Um, at this point, one of the things we're uh, trying to achieve is a way for the modeling tools to be used by work groups to become uh, simple and friendly enough that, that they um, can use them easily and quickly and efficiently. Uh, so that's work that's ongoing right now. Um, the SLDM is one example of the documentation browsers. Uh, that's the stuff that Josh showed, which we're also continuously working on uh, improving. 
uh, crosswalks, for example, is one of the things there that we uh, want to have more, um, more data in. And in terms of water generation, as I mentioned uh, at this point, it's a humble set uh, of things, uh, JSON samples and JSON schemas. Uh, but uh, we will be uh, extending that. Uh, initially, we thought we would work on uh, auto generation of uh, code libraries or at least code components, uh, but we reprioritized and are focusing now on uh, open API schema through the service modeling uh, and also to support uh, JSON LD uh, in the model so that we can output, for example, JSON LD contexts automatically. So yes, that's a quick, quick rundown of what's under the hood. I don't think, Josh, I had any more slides. You can, no, I didn't. Which 40 minutes later takes us into the Q&A Q session. Any questions from the audio from the audience? Feel free to use either the chat or come off mute and talk to us. Nobody. Must have been a long day. Yeah. Yes, yes. Well, if there's no questions, um, we, yes, good point. Uh, we instead show you our email addresses. So if you have any um, any questions or, or whatever, want to get in contact us, uh, with us, just send us an email. Consuelo. Uh, join the committees. Yeah, so the maintenance committee for uh, the common data model is is not uh, in place yet because it's a, a too immature project, so to speak. So that's going to be, I think, uh, probably first half of next year that that uh, uh, committee opens. Yeah. And the, the IMS process around that is that um, once we define the structure and paradigms by which the group is going to operate, there's typically just a mess, a, a notification sent out asking for participants from yep. the membership. Yep. So you'll see an, an email from us basically saying it's going to start and we want people to be involved. Right. Well, welcome. And as for your comment there, Stuart, indeed, um, Open API um, and the Swagger community has uh, boatloads, I think is the correct term of auto-generation uh, tooling available. So by, um, by us being able to auto-generate uh, OIS schemas, uh, we'll open up that whole floodgate as well. Yeah. I'm not sure on what the boatload to truckload conversion is, though. <laughs> yeah. Depends on the size of your ocean, I guess. All right. Any more comments? Otherwise, we'll give you uh, 17 uh, minutes of your lives back to spend uh, however you wish. Thanks, everyone. Have a Thank nice you. rest of your day and see you tomorrow.